So uh, welcome everybody. We are here for um, our UDL IRN Network and Learn session and tonight we are delighted to have with us Dr. David Rose and he is going to be sharing words of wisdom in our first ever Ask Me Anything. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here momentarily. I'd like to share with you just a very brief um, PowerPoint session that, sh that gives you a little description about what we're going to do tonight and more about um, uh, this network and learn and that I, here we go had to find the right button there but I did finally find it and here we go so this is our uh, network and learn. Ask me anything, and you guys are seeing that I'm sure on my on your screen. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, as I mentioned, we're here with Dr. David Rose, and so we're very excited to ask tons of questions and get some good answers, and and maybe some not so good ones too. That's okay. We're here to just have the have fun and uh, see what's on his mind tonight. So if you've got questions that you'd like to ask, please send them via Twitter at hashtag UDLIRN. Uh, questions about universal design for learning, questions about David's background, uh, questions about his future, all are welcome. So we will be monitoring that hashtag and sharing your questions with uh, David Rose tonight. Um, our moderator is Brian Dean, and he will be on at, and answering questions and asking some of his own as well, I'm sure. So with that, I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen and um, give a quick introduction to David and tell you a little bit about, uh, read his bio to give you a little bit about uh, background for on David as well so that we're all clear about exactly who he is. I'm just gonna bring up that document now. And you can go brief on that. I can go brief on that, okay. <laughs> So um, actually, I'm going to have to be really brief, David, because I'm having trouble pulling it up. So I'm going to send it over to Brian That's and good. let him get started, and um, I will get to that. Yeah, it sounds better to get right to it. I'm All fine. right, let's do <laughs> that. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Deed, and I am sitting in the, uh, the best seat right now. Um, I get to uh, ask David Rose a bunch of questions. Um, David Rose, a uh, quick bio from my point of view. Um, the, the, the grand poobah, the big daddy, the grand, the grand poppy of, uh, of UDL, um, and uh, one of the most humble men I've ever met. Um, and I've always, uh, I've always just been very, very struck with David. Um, uh, not to mention that uh, his, his beard is amazing and what I aspire to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but not for How a long time. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing good. Good. I see a little of the beard coming there. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying to catch up. I'm trying to uh, keep it nice and tight like you keep yours. Uh, but you're always looking good, sir. Where are you at tonight? I'm in Washington, D.C. in a oh. hotel. All right. All right. Um, so, uh, David, I just uh, I want to thank you for for uh, joining us. Um, it is uh, without question, it's it's a great way for us to kick off this series of that, this series of Ask Me Anything, where we want to ask practitioners, and we want to ask researchers, and we want to ask um, uh, the titans of the field of UDL um, and and uh, the laymen of the field of, of UDL just the questions that are kind of burning in our minds. So I just want to remind everybody again, if you if you have questions, um, and how could you not? Um, if you have questions, please use uh, Twitter and tweet them at us uh, at hashtag UDLIRN. We have about 17 viewers on our link right now. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to take questions from them. We're going to take questions from Twitter. Um, and uh, I'm, I've got a couple, I got a couple, I'm not gonna lie, I got a couple of myself that I, that I wanna ask. Um, uh, so I'm gonna start off by, by asking uh, a question myself while we, while we start generating. So my first question, or the first question that, that really comes to mind when I think about it is, um, you know, UDL is this, is this brilliant framework and, and we're starting to see such a movement with it. 
uh, but I want to know where it came from. I want to know the beginnings of it. So in doing so, I'm wondering, David, what are your underlying beliefs about, about learning in general? And how did that lead to, to this, con this concept of UDL and the team, like the dream team that, that started building it? Uh, great. Um, uh, I realized I should have said when you first asked, I just want to explain why I'm in Washington. Oh, yes, please do. Uh, please. It's your uh, show. It's your world. You run it. Okay. Well, just there's a uh, group that's been pulled together uh, to, um, uh, to try to uh, prepare for a new administration in Congress. And uh, primarily around what we know from the learning sciences, um, and it would, you know, be kind of some documents probably and some meetings, but it's uh, a, um, yeah, literally a meeting of researchers and practitioners around uh, what do we know from the learning sciences and how should that affect policy. It's primarily for, um, again, people who are going to be in the administration and people who are in Congress. And uh, that's why I'm here, and I can certainly tell you more about that. Um, but it's great, of course, that UDL is at the table here. This is, you know, only 20 people. Um, and, uh, you know, UDL is one of the things that people are looking to to see how does this fit into a new uh, Congress and a new um, uh, administration. And uh, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, so now that's that powerful. That's so powerful, David. Well, we'll we'll see, you know, and yeah. I'll tell you the, you know, if we can uh, stop the recording, I'll tell you what people are really talking about. But <laughs> I got you. I got you. That's the after that's the after show. <laughs> yeah, right. Every, you know, everybody's like you can imagine uh with the debate to follow, uh you know, on people's mind is it's a big difference which administration we're talking about. Uh anyway, um uh, so to your question, I, um, I realize there's sort of that I'd like to today, and that is um, I was teaching in an inner city high school in Boston, Massachusetts with um, uh, students who were doing very poorly. Um, they'd been specifically um, brought out, uh, and I had asked for, um, I wanted to work with, uh, students who were really, uh, struggling. So I got a lot of them, 120, um, kids who were taking high school English and who were reading, uh, at a first, second, or third grade level. And, uh, we had a very, um, now it would seem quaint, curriculum of, you know, books like Ivanhoe and Great Expectations and things like that. And this was quite just uh, unimaginable for the reading level of the students I had, not to mention the interest level. Um, and, um, but then the, the, I don't know, sort of a third of the way through the year um, on the curriculum was to teach Romeo and Juliet. And I really thought that would be cool. The whole themes were just right age, everything. And uh, a lot of my kids were in gangs and Romeo and Juliet is a gang play. Yeah, for sure, for uh, so sure. I, okay, we got, this is authentic. This is uh, just right for my age group, first love, all that stuff. Um, but then I had the, uh-oh, what am I gonna do about the reading problem? And um, so we didn't have technology, of course, and so I would, bring in a 78 RPM record and, and slap one of those discs on. They're back in favor now, I know. And uh, we would just uh, read along together um, with the Royal Shakespeare Company doing the uh, acting aloud. And then we would do all kinds of things, which now seem commonplace. And uh, we would act out scenes and we would try alternatives and we would, um, um, you know, write some for sure. Everybody had to journal, even though they weren't very polished writers. Um, but we were mostly interacting around uh, Shakespeare. But it, I realized that it wasn't, I didn't want to do a 
um, a Cliff Notes version, because the whole point of Shakespeare is the beautiful language. Sure. Sure. And rather than, you know, sometimes there's just, you know, learn the plot. And I knew I didn't want that. I wanted them to experience what Shakespeare really was. And so I remember beginning with the, there's the play opens with the, uh, doing the dozens, we used to call it, but um, what's the word for it now, Brian? Uh, uh, ins hurling insults at each other from boring games. Right, right, when you start roasting each other. Yeah, roasting each other. <laughs> what's cool about the Shakespeare is how rich their insults are. You know, they're yeah. colorful and, you know, and original. And so we spent a whole week just on the insults and how do you make better insults? And, you know, we talked about similes and analogies, you know, your mother's an old shoe and, you know, how can we make that rich? <laughs> and uh, so kids got into being, uh, you know, playing in the halls with insulting each other in uh, rich um, metaphoric language and so on. And I thought that was a success. And we, anyway, had fun, acted out, did a lot of acting and all of those things. And I think that was for me the, not, I didn't know anything about UDL or didn't know anything about technology or anything like that. So it wasn't the start of UDL, but it was the start of understanding that I could have my students really participate in high level discussions and acting out and so on about Shakespeare, even though they were poor decoders, had poor vocabularies, all sorts of things like that. And that stuck with me that, cause I, I absolutely thought that we were talking Shakespeare by the end of that unit. That is, they were critiques, they were uh, applying it to their own lives, they had meaning out of it. And um, I think that put a seed in my head that you can get to high level stuff if I would scaffold the lower level stuff like the decoding and the vocabulary. When I became a neuropsychologist, we um, were looking at how, what are the kinds of ways that we can help kids get to high level stuff. And uh, UDL was born at North Shore Children's Hospital where we were clinicians who um, were asked the same question. We got these kids, they're, you know, remedial, everything. They're not, you know, they're not keeping up in anything. They're going to be dropping out and all of that. So then um, we began to look at, can technology help us here? You know, the, we don't want 78 RPM records, but is there some way that we can begin to get kids to high level interactions with the curriculum, whether it's science, geography, or Shakespeare? So that's uh, sort of where all of this started. You know, I, I love that story. Um, and, it, and it's one that, that I've heard parts of, um, but what I love about it is the way that you frame uh, the, you frame this interaction with curriculum. It's, it starts to feel like the curriculum is another entity, right? Like it's another, it's another student and that's really all it is, or it's another person within the room. And this interaction that they start to have is, is a very organic one. And I, and it, to me, that speaks to this idea of accessibility that, that isn't um, our typical idea of, of, of accessibility. Like, um, you know, do they need, do they need uh, an audio book or, you know, how are they going to access, access it at this other side, but really how are they going to access it meaningfully for themselves? Um, so, so I, I appreciate you sharing that story. It, 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 it really frames, it really frames where it comes from, right? Uh, and and uh, where you see it um, and that whole engagement piece. Um, I do have, uh, I do have a question. Uh, comes from uh, actually Sue Harden, uh, so on Twitter at Sue as, at S Harden twenty two, and uh, uh, she she heard you drop a little bit about uh, about to fit into the into a new Congress. And what, I don't know how much of that you can share, how much of that is is top secret. But how do you see it? Uh, well, it's not top secret. Um, okay. uh, the you know I don't know. <laughs> Uh, just had the first day and uh, this is an all day meeting tomorrow. Um, and today was just sharing uh, what we think is critical about uh, learning sciences. What have we learned that needs to, to inform public policy? So today wasn't the policy making itself or policy recommendations. It was just, what do we know? And uh, that would inform us so that when we, you know, write and talk with people, uh, we can point to the research as opposed to 
just our impressions. But there was some very compelling uh, contributions from people who are not researchers at all, but who are practitioners who uh, run schools and uh, are teachers. And they were part of the conversation, which I thought was wonderful that they were there and they, and they grounded it in the complementary way. Yeah, well, we know things from research and we know things from what we do as teachers and those need to go together um, to inform policy. So tomorrow, so I, there's nothing really to share um, uh, until really after tomorrow where we'll, um, the day will be, what should be in policies that we would recommend? Uh, and by the way, I don't want to over aggrandize this. Uh, this, you know, not at all given that anybody would pay attention to this, uh, in the end, but, um, I think it's a, there's certainly some pretty serious people here. And, yeah. and people who have made policy before. So that's kind of uh, uh, confirming. It's nice that I would say that um, so there's, as I said, about 20 people, I would say 80% of them know what UDL is, which I thought was great. Wow, that, that's got to feel good, um, uh, just in the, in the sense of the movement. And, and to me, UDL is, you know, when we... we it's easy to say that there are tons of movements within within education and and I find it hard sometimes when we look at them to really call certain things movements but it seems to me and I may be biased right because uh, 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 um, uh, I'm a UDL zealot but it seems to me that UDL really does feel like a movement and it really does feel like um, I love your phrasing of we're bringing practitioners and researchers and how are those are, those are informing each other and making and both moving forward um, and so uh, what I have seen from CAST and what I've seen uh, from the IRN and, and really all the different organizations that are, that are going on um, is that the movement is growing, right? Uh, and it seems to be growing quite a bit here in the U.S. Um, um, uh, out there in Twitter, um, what are you seeing as global trends around UDL? Uh, great question. I'm not sure I'm... Uh, the best person to answer that, uh, I know uh, a number of um, uh, people from the IRN are traveling and uh, doing talks all over. Um, I'll, I'll tell you uh, just maybe a couple of thoughts from my own experience. Um, and I have been to Chile, so it's nice to see Pamela there. And I'm uh, uh, returning to Chile in a couple of weeks. Uh, Pamela, can you signal me if you know that I'm coming or not? Um, but uh, are you looking for a place to stay? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I have a place to stay, and I even I can't. I, mean, I should talk with Pamela offline, but I even have a been suggested where to go after. I'm going to take a little time off and see Chile without. Uh, Giving any talks, but Chile has a, a lot of UDL moving. It's, uh, and I'm sure Pamela knows more than I do about it, but UDL is part of the national landscape from what I hear, and that's why they wanted me to come down. They're uh, bringing my wife even, um, because there's energy and enthusiasm, and it's written into public policy in Chile, which is amazing. Um, and there's other countries where that's happening as well. Um, and uh, the difference, um, and it's true, uh, I think, to a large extent, not completely in Chile, um, but um, in Europe for sure, is that UDL is beginning more at the university and college level than at K-12. Mm -hmm. um, that when I'm asked to speak, or and I think the same is true for other people that are doing this, um, it's colleges and universities wanting to... Uh, which is great, wanting to uh, be able to teach teachers and so on. So they want to be, they figure that's the leverage point is to get um, incoming and sustaining teachers. And so they're starting there. But it's, uh, it's evolving in interesting ways. Um, so a second thing I'd like to say is Ireland um, has a lot of uh, UDL enthusiasm, one of the, um, I'd say, most countries as well. And um, they have, are forming a new university, which is uh, uh, agglutinating, that's probably not a word, but 
bringing together uh, a number of colleges, which here in the U.S. would be community and technical colleges, uh, and they're going to make a, a brand new university. But they uh, had me meet with the um, the very top level of the sort of small group that is planning the university. And uh, they want to have UDL be a foundational um, uh, foundation to the whole university. Um, and they're going to have, you know, various things that I do and other people do. Um, but it's not just sort of how can, you know, we teach a faculty member to, you know, make his slides accessible. But uh, if we are starting a university and we wanted it to be an expression of UDL, uh, how would we start it? So that's like really exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, and I would say um, there's a lot of countries uh, that are now in various ways uh, beginning to do UDL. So there's gonna be travel for a lot of us, I think. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other immediate stories. Um, yeah, that's probably, that's maybe the, the main thing I think is that starting at the universities and colleges is where it's starting. Yeah, so that's, that, that to me uh, opens up really interesting resources, right? And how are we training teachers? Um, and if teachers have this mentality of, of accessibility from several different ways, not just to when they enter into schools, there's obviously going to be a shift there. Um, and so I find, I find that fascinating. Are we seeing that uh, here in, in the US where, where we have a lot of universities that are starting to look at UDL practice? Um, yeah. Um, some of you, I think, know Sam Johnston at CAST, and mm -hmm. he's really heading up um, our work with colleges and universities. And um, the website, uh, Mindy can link us, it's, uh, um, Mindy, can you put the address for uh, the uh, uh, higher education site that we have? Um, and uh, there's a ton of resources there uh, for college and university teachers. And uh, what's interesting is that um, the support for getting that work going uh, has come from the Department of Labor. Um, Uh, for the future and uh, to do that we need to be teaching in different ways because we have students who are um, coming uh, often with uh, English as not their first language often with not a, a, a strong college orientation in their families etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, they are looking to uh, become technicians uh, nurses medical assistants all kinds of things that the labor force desperately uh, root for that and uh, so those um, um, so the Department of Labor has been pouring a ton of money into upgrading uh, uh, post-secondary institutions and they too have said, we got to have UDL in this mix because we have non-traditional learners at the very least, lots of uh, students who we've called disabled because school didn't work well for them the first time. And um, so that uh, um, they're looking to say, we, we got to have uh, a better way to teach, which I think is great. Uh, and I, I think it's worth saying that um, in some ways, The people teaching it are often practitioners who already are a skilled uh, uh, carpenter or plumber or medical technician or whatever, um, but have not seen themselves as educators, um, but as skilled craftsmen. And in a way, they're almost a, a beautiful entry point for UDL because that kind of book learning wasn't what attracted them, uh, wasn't what they were good at. And so in some ways, they're like easy to convince that you should yeah, get, yeah. you know, we need projects 
we need right. people who are doing projects and learning from doing them. You don't, you shouldn't be lecturing no matter what, you know, cause a lot of them come in thinking that, Oh my God, I have to start lecturing. And I don't know how to lecture. And we're like, no, don't start lecturing. You right. Know, right. You can make a, you know, a better educational experience in ways that are organic and natural for the ways in which they're going to work. And that, and that, by the way, is the same with the, the university in um, Dublin, that they realize, whoa, this standard teacher lecturing with slides doesn't actually prepare our students for where they're going to go. And um, uh, we should draw on what they do know how to do, you know, a UDL thing, uh, to say, uh, let's talk about your apprenticeship and what worked for you and how do we make that into a good experience for everybody else. Right. Well, so I, I and that and that that to me is again just highlights that idea that that practitioners are are moving the movement, right? Um, and that it's and that while policy is important and we are moving towards policy, that this is still very much a practitioner's movement. Um, and I think that's amazing. And so so we're going to start to see uh, that seventy two slide deck uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, system start to fade away and say what is meaningful to us and and really. Um, how do we experience our learning, right? So to me, that's this, this larger idea. It's not just how do I get the information, but how do I experience it? How do I interact with it? Um, so Leanne Woodley, from, um, she's one of our viewers, and she's, uh, she's out in Australia, and she's saying, she says, uh, the UDL movement's alive and well, uh, and it's gaining some momentum. But her big question today is uh, what advice, uh, she, she says, the teachers I work with uh, understand the principles. They get it right? And they're down and they're on board. But what advice would you give to help teachers delve into the guidelines and the checkpoints go a little bit deeper? Yeah. Well, this is something that we've been learning a lot about. It won't be a surprise to many people in the IRN, but um, we have been correctly chastised for not being good teachers about a lot of this in that we too began with a, you should learn the guidelines and, uh, you know, uh, get them all nine under your belt. I don't think we ever quite said that, but it was implied. And then, you know, start applying to think that way, you know, here, swallow the whole elephant uh, before you can do anything. Uh, right. So we too have moved uh, very strongly uh, toward a, a some of you will be familiar with the term improvement science um, and away from implementation science, which is we know what to do. And science is different than implementation science, but it's a form of implementation, but it's much more comfortable uh, to a UDL perspective in that it says you should be in a attitude of trying out things and finding what works and improving it. Um, and uh, that the best way to start doing UDL is to choose something small. Try something and see if it works. Find a good way to evaluate so you can actually know it works, and then try something else. But build a repertoire um, as you would um, uh, any other thing. I, I used to teach juggling, and uh, you don't start by doing the whole chuckling thing at the beginning. You start with one ball and then you do two and so on. And um, so now we're very much more in the, um, oh, let's get started. And oh, by the way, that allows me to say something else that everybody knows and probably knew before I did that. Um, the first thing is to say, what are you already doing that's UDL? And there's no teacher that isn't already doing a whole lot of things that are UDL. And the first thing is to just recognize that and say, great, let me hear more of what you're doing. And that's fabulous. You know, we call that guideline three, um, but you're already doing it great. Um, how can we either get that, you know, richer or would you like to work on something, try something else in one of the other things, but start incrementally, not try to do the whole thing. Don't try to teach everybody nine guidelines and say, you know, learn that before we start, but um, starting, um, incrementally and a thing that we're increasingly doing is teaching an attitude of experimentation try it you know fast iterations do something yes. now and pay attention and i think a lot of you've heard katie novak talk and she's a, a queen of 
getting feedback. She asks every week, her, she gets, the kids know what the nine guidelines are, and she has the Moving toward that thing, I think when we began, we thought, like a lot of people, well, we're going to put out the guidelines and we're going to, you know, test people on whether they know them or something. I don't know. We didn't quite do that. But, you know, that you need to be in classes or something for a while. And now we don't think that. We think teachers know a lot. First thing to do is recognize it. Say, wow, you are already doing a lot of UDL here. And... Then we ask, you know, what's an area where you feel weak that you'd like to grow? What, what are the kind of things, what are the problems you see um, in your own teaching? And then let's see how UDL can help you do that. But you're already doing a lot of good things. How do we incrementally and then how do you, how will you know whether it's worked? That's the key thing. How right. will you know? And then we have improvement. In fact, I have to say this, uh, just at the thing I'm at today, that loomed as one of the big things that we wanted to say on a policy front is a movement toward this kind of iterative improvement cycles that schools need to be in the continuous improvement rather than, you know, test them at the end of the year and give them a failing grade or a passing grade, you know, which just not good pedagogy anyway. Right. So, uh, you know, one of the learning science things that we're going to tell Congress and so on is, um, iterative cycles of trying out and getting better rather than Brian. Uh, oh, I think that's, I think that's brilliant. Uh, it's, you know, Joy Zabala, uh, she, she dropped this quote on a network and learn a while ago and, and I loved it. Um, and I use it. Um, Joy, if you're, if you're out there watching, I steal it all the time. Uh, She says, don't try to boil the ocean, right? <laughs> and I love it, right? Like she, and you know, you know how Joy is, she just dropped it and didn't think anything of it. And I scooped it up and I was like, that's wisdom and that's gold, right? Don't try to swallow the whole elephant, right? Yeah. Don't try to boil the ocean. What are you doing, right? Start from this, from this really strength-based kind of view and say, what are we doing? Uh, and I love how you talk about iterative, um, iterative design, right? Because the D in UDL is design. And are we looking at education from a designer's point of view? Um, and that iterative prototyping, that fast and rapid prototyping is, well, something that's near and de dear to me, but, but um, it's just so great to hear you say that, that we were here, we started here in implementation science, and now we wanna to move towards improvement. So even we are looking at it and saying, how do we keep moving it? How do we keep changing it? Um, and, and I think that there's a lot to be learned from that. And, I, and it, this leads to Ron Rogers' question. Um, uh, one of our, um, I'm just going to put this plug out there. Ron Rogers is uh, the great UDL chat, not only archiver, but uh, one of the founding members. Uh, and he says, or he asked the question that, that it makes a lot of sense when we talk about industry looking uh, for UDL solutions um, and looking at um, UDL as a solution. So, how does how do we start to do that move UDL from just this idea of an educational approach to more of a this is an approach in in the workplace as well? Do you have any any ideas any suggestions? Well, I know that that is a um, uh, what should I say a field out there that's waiting to be tapped. We yeah. definitely have had people reach out to us. How do I because as you know, every corporation thinks it's a learning organization. It needs to be to survive. And um, I think it's becoming more and more interesting uh, to corporations uh, uh, to figure out how do we become a learning organization. And to do that, you want to make sure everybody learns. Um, so I don't think I'm uh, knowledgeable enough. And uh, but somebody i think maybe in this uh zoom somebody's out there thinking i'm ready to take off and start doing it and if you do that tell us because we can start to you know send uh queries um uh because those are they're definitely starting and uh i will say we're uh i'm very excited about um a new project we've started a cast, which is 
with Youth Build. I don't know how many people know Youth Build. It looks like you do, Brian. Mm -hmm. Youth Build. So it's a national organization that takes uh, students who have uh, mostly dropped out of school. School didn't work for them. And I forget, what's the word for that, Brian? There's a, a word that people use for um, students are sort of out there and not graduated and not in any kind of schooling. Um, and um, the neat thing about youth build is that they begin not by going back to remedial reading and stuff, but by uh, having the kids begin constructing, constructing houses, constructing docks, whatever it is, that they begin uh, to learn trades, um, things that they can use, but then they embed the learning, even academic learning, directly in that. So it's authentic. It's all got all kinds of UDL things about it. It's authentic, meaningful, blah, blah, blah. blah. There are choices. People choose the kind of trade that they're going to work on. But the academic learning is embedded in that. You know, we're going to read this because it is a, uh, whatever, a manual for what you're going to be doing. Now, we right. hope it's universally designed. But anyway, um, well, no, actually, that's what we're going to do together. That is, they have lots of barriers in what they do. And so we've gone together and we've written a fairly big grant to say, okay, what if we wed UDL into workforce? Excited about that project because those are quintessentially kids for whom traditional schooling didn't work. And um, they're out there and um, uh, they need to learn um, certainly uh, skills and trades and things like that. But in that context is a good place to learn to read, write, to learn to make videos, to learn to teach other people, to learn to communicate effectively, to learn comprehension, all of those things, but within a context that makes sense uh, to that student. So um, I think workplaces are really terrific places where learning can occur. I think they're much better. I'm going on too long with this. You can cut me off, Brian. But I think, you know, what model I think is not very successful is having uh, students who are non-traditional, whatever that word means, come to community college and they have to take a year or two of remedial reading and writing before they can take the courses for which they've really come there because the dropout rates are gigantic um, because it's actually they've left the school system because that wasn't working for them. And then we say, okay, now in order to do what you want to do, you're going to have to do the things you really hate doing first. And it might take you and it does for some years. Um, so the better approach is to begin right on day one with great. We're starting with electrical engineering day one, but we're going to universally design the materials so you can read them, so you can see them if you're blind and so on and so forth. Um, but we're putting it in the context of something that is meaningful and engaging, and we think we're going to get much better retention um, to that. And I think Youth Build is going to be a neat, I'm looking forward to that. And I think, yeah. I think yeah. Brian and Suno, I've got an interest in prison reform right. for the yes, same. Um, those kids are the, it's been estimated in Massachusetts, 75% of the kids in juvenile uh, detention are were, um, uh, learning disabled uh, or one of the other high incidence disabilities, 75%. So they're just really a catch-all, uh, the prison system for our school failures. And um, I, that is really a crime when we put them in prison and then we do the bad things to them again is, you know, that's horrible. So, right. Right. Well, and, and uh, what I love, again, it comes down to this engagement piece, right? And how do we have students or learners of any kind, right? Whether whatever continuum they lie along, um, how do we have them wrap their interest around this continual task of, of what is meaningful, right? So reading a technical manual is reading a technical manual. Uh, via the ways of, of, of you know, having it you know, read to us or, or, or all of these other ways, um, it's, still a it's still a technical manual.
right? So there has to be this engagement point where we're really saying, this is why, this is the relevance of what we do. Um, and so that sounds like that's a great project. And it leads me to this other question that uh, Alex Hollingsworth uh, asked us. Um, so, so you have students who, who non-traditional or, non or variable or, or, or school hasn't been working. Um, uh, and that's one, one interesting population to work with. But what about this, this idea of, of um, our low incidence? What about this uh, severe, for lack of a better term, severe disabilities at 1% population? How does UDL start to work for them? Um, you know, it's funny. I was just talking about that today that uh, one of the best, um, back to the original question, how did I get mm -hmm. here? That I did two years as a, um, I forget what the word is, but uh, line staff um, at an institution for the severely and uh, profoundly, uh, we used to say, retarded. Um, and uh, that was, in its own way, like the Shakespeare story I said, a really pivotal thing because um, your first impression when, when you get on the, this is in an institution, these are, these are really separate and many of them are, the ones that were still there were largely self-injurious or uh, in potentially injurious to others and or profoundly, profoundly uh, disabled. And um, when you first show up as a, you know, little uh, twerp like I was, you know, you just think, oh my God, there's nothing to work with here. And then you meet some of the staff that have done it for their entire lives, and they see this enormous potential uh, learning in those individuals. And it just is, you just kind of think, oh my God. And yes, everything takes longer and so on and so forth, but they have real breakthroughs. They have, and it really was uh, another pivotal experience for me that um, we need to expect learning and if we do and we're careful designers we'll get learning and we'll get a lot of it even for people who have uh, very severe severe disabilities um, the challenge and maybe that's why you're asking this question is the sort of easy thing is in UDL when people have uh, what Todd Rose calls jagged um, profiles because yes. um, then you can use the strengths like a Derek to drag up the weaknesses or to compensate for them. So jagged profiles are really cool. Um, and everybody I think is gonna understand that, yeah, but we wanna, we wanna work with that jaggedness and uh, their strengths to work with. What's harder is if you have a, a more global cognitive disability, intellectual disability, where you don't see the jaggedness, where it's, um, profound in motor, sensory, sort of all of the parts, um, you don't have those leverage points as obvious. Um, and uh, I can't say that I'm an expert at doing that, um, but I know that there are people who are, and I saw them, uh, you know, just, they too looked for jackedness. Um, when I saw globality, I just saw this is a person who can't do much. Uh, they saw it, but boy, did you see how he can move his eyes? You know, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. And we're going to amplify those eye movements, and uh, he's going to communicate that way, and uh, he's going to start doing all kinds of cool things. And um, so they, I, I, what I saw is that they kind of generated the jackedness because they really went after, we're going to go after those eye movements for a whole year if we have to. Um, and uh, we're going to make that be the vehicle. And um, I have to say, uh, those, uh, and we've certainly had some of those at CAS too, where people were assumed to be profoundly um, intellectually disabled, where all they just needed was a good outlet, a uh, good uh, expression device, and then kind of quick uh, learning. Uh, I that's a very good answer. Help me if you want. Um, no, no. I, well, I, I like the answer because, um, first of all, I got to give a shout out to uh, the Jagger Profiles, Todd Rose, uh, End of Average. Amazing read. If you and your crew uh, at school are not reading it, um, then you are, you are definitely missing out. Um, 
it's fantastic. And, and it really does get to that idea of where do we find variability and looking for those small pieces and really working from those. Um, and so uh, I, I, what I really take away, um, one of the big pieces I take away from any time that I hear you talk, David, uh, uh, is this sense of passion that you have for these disenfranchised students um, and what those disenfranchised students may be and where they come, you know, like where low incidence area or they may be disenfranchised uh, along the adjudication pipeline. Um, but in all of those cases, <clears throat> what what uh, comes out is this passion so um we are coming up on on about 15 minutes left so i, I have some really key questions that i want to know about the future and where you see the future going and one of those is actually um comes from also sue uh and it's that idea of where as you, during your retirement right uh where does that begin to go where does that focus uh and that passion on disenfranchised students where does that begin to what's the next thing uh, well, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I will say just uh, since we're just talking about Todd Rose, so he's here at this learning sciences group. And um, uh, so it's been great to reconnect with him. Yeah. The, uh, so as you know, uh, I failed in my first attempt at retirement. And uh, so I'm a, uh, you know, slow learner in that uh, regard. We don't, we don't call that a failure. We call that the Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm trying to be a little bit better about that. And uh, we were talking before that um, getting grandchildren now. And so they're going to be an attraction. Um, the um, I'm working on a, a book. I'm going to be um, able to refocus on that. Uh, Maybe I'll tell you just a little in, inside where he, uh, Cast is, uh, has appointed a new CEO and she'll be starting in, uh, today's the 19th, so she'll be starting in, uh, you know, like 10 days. And, um, and she's an experienced educator, which is great. And she's run organizations before and, and she'll be um, uh, able to lead the organization to its next phase. And uh, that will allow me to concentrate more on things that I really want to do. And I'm in an enviable place in my career where I don't, I'm certainly not a wealthy person, but I, I don't need to earn a lot of money. Um, I've got my IRA and stuff. And so I can pick and uh, choose a little bit. So I'm going to stay at CAST on a reduced capacity and uh, I do want to do the book the books on emotional design and it's um, sponsored actually by Intel uh, who want to know yeah I want to know what is the future and what should we be thinking about when we think about what a chip's got to do and so they wanted me to um, uh, to gather the evidence about engagement because one of our three principles right right um and uh i've learned a ton um, about it and uh i now need to finish uh uh putting that out and uh, um and i'm trying to think if there's anything i want to say about it the uh i'm very interested in um what are the measures of engagement um as you know important precursors to measures of learning so um, the neat thing about some of the new technologies and i saw jamie basham's name there he might be lurking and he knows more about this than i do but um looking at um the kind of uh gorgeous online data that is um not as good as a teacher who's looking at a kid and working with them face to face. Uh, I want to be clear. Right. But is enormously good when you're working with more than one kid, keeping track of what's working, what's not working, what are the kids trying, what are they not trying, are they getting help when they need it, are they avoiding help when they should be getting it, you know, all kinds of things that we can actually gather data on now that we couldn't before. And um, some people are looking at new kinds of measures of engagement. What are the 
what are the kinds of clicks and in what patterns um, suggest that the kids have lost interest, lost caring about it? What are the ones that indicate um, we should be going um, uh, faster, that we should be more challenging and so on? Uh, so I've been looking at a lot of that kind of new data um, um, and new ways of, of looking at learning. And some of that is, is kind of cool. Um, and um, so I'll, that's certainly one thing. I think you know, Brian, that I'm interested in uh, going back to teaching a bit. Um, and I'd like to, I'd actually like to teach in one of the juvenile justice system incarcerated uh, facilities. Um, and, you know, those are kids that have really um, you know, had the worst of everything. They're often, their, uh, their environment wasn't working for them and schools should have picked up the slack, but didn't. And the schools were often punitive and awful and not good at teaching them. And so they've had a lot of failure and, um, uh, and now we're punishing them. So, um, I, uh, have, you know, visited now and, um, sort of need this new director to come on so I feel safe to just do whatever I want. But um, the uh, I, I want to say something about what I found is that I, uh, you know, we all have negative stereotypes about things. And I thought the people who taught the educators, there are educators in the prison system. And I thought they would be kind of dead enders, people who like, uh, I don't want to work too hard. And, you know, nobody cares about this. So I'm sure. not going to mark my time, but that wasn't my experience. My experience was that these are very dedicated people. Yeah. They really want to be, they see it the way a lot of us would, that these are kids that uh, were dealt a really a bad deck uh, on both environment and, and school. And uh, they care about them. So I'm very uh, kind of excited about trying to, just be teaching. I don't want to do anything smart of trying to make it programmatic or run anything or anything, but just kind of go in three days a week and, uh, and teach, you know, Shakespeare. Um, there you go. There you go. Get back to the source, right? The truth. Full circle. Yeah. I will say one of the things I noticed, one of the best teachers in the system that I've seen so far was this art teacher who doesn't even get paid, she, but she goes in two or three days a week. Yeah. And a lot of the students for whom that is their real outlet. They're just, they were fabulous designers, but of course in school, they were just told you got to be in remedial reading. Yeah. So we beat it out of you. And, uh, and then she comes in and all of a sudden, you know, some of them are gifted designers, but nobody knew that because they weren't allowed to take art class because it was considered a frill. Uh, and they needed to be taking remedial English, you know, and so that's one of the just awful things. So that's sort of what I would like to do, maybe some mix of finishing the engagement book and um, some working with um, kids who've been disengaged for a long time. Well, well, it's good that you, uh, it's good that you slow it down. You just dropped a bunch. <laughs> you dropped a bunch of things there, sir. Uh, you dropped uh, the gender of the new CEO. Right, <laughs> you drop the fact that that you got a book coming. Right, you drop the fact that you would love to teach again. That's that's all amazing. You just never stop, uh, and it and it amazes me, and and I think that's this amazing legacy and this amazing cyclical thing that's happening where you're going back to where you came from. Right, like you're visiting, you're coming back to your roots, and and finding that. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a good way to put it, Brian. As uh, you know, there are times when I think that, um, you know, running an organization, leading an organization was a long distraction that I just really, uh, I wanted to be a better teacher. You know, that's where it all started. And, uh, uh, you know, CAST was just this fabulous garden of creativity and smartness to help me be a better teacher. And now I'm too old, of course, to really be a good teacher. I'm no, I'm no Brian Dean now. Uh, but, um, I'm, uh, uh, but I feel like, uh, I don't know if you know the, the book, uh, uh, Gideon's trumpet. It's one of the most affecting books I've ever seen. It's about, uh, it's a book about, um, Abe Fortas who was on the Supreme court and it was, uh, about Gideon was a, a poor, 
uh, person in uh, southern state, Georgia maybe, uh, who was uh, unrepresented uh, and uh, was incarcerated. And Abe Fortas was head of a big law firm in New York City, one of the top firms. And he decided, you know what, I want to do something good in my life. So he took like 20 lawyers, went down to Georgia to get the case, to take Gideon. And he was Gideon's trumpet. And they brought Gideon's case all the way to the Supreme Court, which was the one that, in fact, said people need to be represented, even poor people, even oh, people who can't read and stuff. And so I love that image of, you know, someone who had great power and deciding where can I use that? And I think, uh, you know, when I think about what I want to do at the end, and I'm starting a little too late, is that, you know, we've sort of gotten a lot of power. Cass has given me a lot of power and ideas. And um, I think it'll be mostly other people that really do it. But I want a little chance to uh, be Abe Fortas to come into, you know, something like a prison. Maybe it's a youth build thing. Maybe it's but somewhere. But now with, uh, you know, what should I say, with big guns. And I can call up uh, people like Brian Dean and uh, and say, can you come here? I don't know what to do with this. And uh, But I know people now. I can get some pretty powerful uh, equivalent of lawyers into a prison somewhere. And yeah. that's sort of uh, riding off into the sunset feels great. Wow. I, you know, uh, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for, for the shout outs. And we're, and we're coming to the end of our time, which uh, seemed to, to, to come very quickly. Um, uh, but I, I do have uh, two questions to ask you. Um, I am wondering, uh, we, we're seeing CAS Symposium uh, pop up and we're seeing uh, the UDLI and Summit and uh, we're seeing all these other um, beginning groups that, that are coming up and, and starting to host their own kind of UDL um, UDL Palooza, for lack of a better term, right? Um, and and I love them. Um, I'm wondering what your take is on those, and, and what that what that legacy, what you see as being that legacy, just as one of our ending questions. And then I got one more for you. Okay, um, I I think this is fabulous, and I think you know, and uh, uh, Jamie's been the leader on this. That the issue uh, now is to um, find a way to incent really good implementations, really good uh, teachers, really, et cetera. Um, uh, looking, how do we do that with this? And we're looking at a system like the LEAD system, as I think some people on the phone uh, already know, um, for how do we reward people who are really doing a good job? What I think none of us wants to do is punish people who are doing a bad job. It's not a good, that whole thing that we did in education recently, punishing schools for being bad is just a whole right, right. pedagogy. And, but we want some incentive systems that would allow people to say, I want to be better and to provide vehicles that are uh, standards based so that people can know, I really do. I'm a good UDL teacher. I'm a good UDL administrator. I'm a good UDL product. Um, so giving people, a, a, you know, ladders to climb to be able to say, I'm getting better and better is something I think that we're, us and the UDL IRN and the UDL, uh, um, task force are getting together to do. And it's very, I think it's very exciting. So that I think is the important legacy that there's a system in place by which people can grow and feel like they're good learners. We want the teachers and the product developers to feel like, there's things I'm aiming toward. I want to be the best uh, uh, designer that I can be. And there's courses I can take and things that I should look at and models and so on. And I think that'll be great. That'll be a great legacy yeah. of all of us, not of me particularly, but of the whole movement. Right. So, so are we going to see you at the summit this year at the UDL IRED summit? Of course. All right. See, there you go, folks. That's product endorsement. Bing. <laughs> I have one last question for you, and it's a little off the wall, but I said I told everybody, I told all our tweeples that uh, I would ask it. So it's a two-part question. Um, here's the first part. Well, I'm just going to give it to you, and you let me know what you think. If you were a cereal, what cereal would you be, and what would be the prize that you would find inside? Oh, the prize. Ah, see, well, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I was thinking immediately of being a kid and going and buying. Uh, Cheerios boxes that had the prize inside yes. and trying to figure out what to do with the Cheerios that wasn't <laughs> obvious. Uh, 
So let's see. So say it again. What kind of cereal? What kind of cereal would you be? If I was, what would be? If you were a cereal, what kind would it be? And then what would be the prize that we would find inside? Uh, so I would clearly be a, I, I just bought one that's got a great name. I'll have to ping it out later, but, uh, it was like, it's like big owls or something. Oh, nice. It's, a uh, a fireman somewhere decided he wanted to make a uh, cereal that firemen would love. Interesting challenge. Anyway, yeah. so it's a mix of everything. It's got hay bales and, uh, uh, raisins and uh, straw this and that it's just full of junk um, and uh, some crispy things and some sweet things and it's just uh, quite a so uh, I just bought my first box and uh, uh, if I, as long as I put some cream on it I love it right uh, and so I, the diversity of it is what I like I'm not so good on just corn checks yeah gotcha the prize um, well, we got some people that are that are shouting out what they think the prize would be inside and oh, what cereal you I, would be. So, so that's that's pretty funny. Someone say there'd be multiple prizes inside, or <laughs> uh, that they think you'd be fruity pebbles because it's a good mix. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I'd want the cereal itself to be the prize. There's no doubt about it. There was there'd be yeah. I guess the best thing would be that there'd be some, you know, random boxes would have some you know, saffron coated something or other that was like, you know, really expensive and really silly and really, but you know, every once in a while, Oh no, this reminds me, you know what I, my wife once in a while makes is some desserts, frozen desserts that are like, you know, lime made frozen. Yeah. Yeah. That description, but with jalapeno peppers in it. Oh, a little surprise, a you little know, surprise. You don't know when you're going to sip it. But, you know, all of a sudden you get this zing. So maybe that would be a, a few zingers embedded. Robin. There you go. That's, it's, so that's a, that's a fantastic question and, and uh, a fantastic answer to the question. Um, I, I want to give everybody a shout out and give you a reminder. If you're watching this, uh, UDL chat is starting out. It's all participant questions. Send questions to the UDL uh, Twitterverse, and uh, that's hashtag UDL chat, all one word. Uh, and Mindy has jumped over there, and she's uh, she's working with that and uh, um, uh, moderating that. David Rose, sir, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, this has been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, we have so many comments from people saying UDL is so global, uh, it's so amazing, uh, and you're so accessible. Uh, and then we have a lot of people saying that you have this fantastic beard, and I got to agree with them. <laughs> thank, so, I want to thank shout out thank you to Sue for setting this up and uh, anytime I get to talk with Brian Dean I'm happy all right I appreciate that we'll talk all the time uh, glad to have you. you heard that David Rose dropped a shout out <laughs> <laughs> we're so glad you could join us tonight David it was a wonderful evening we've got great responses from um, from everybody and thank you thank you thank you so much great um all right, so I uh, I can't be on UDL chat because I am supposed to be in a, uh, uh, a dinner thing, so I've got to go back. <laughs> All right, we'll excuse you. Thank you again so much. I'm just going to give one last shout out. Um, I'm going to put up David's bio as I promised because I didn't get it up the first time, and then talk a little bit about the network and learn that's coming up. So David, if you have to jump off, you feel free to do that. And we thank you so very much. All right, thank well, you again, sir. All right, it's always good to see you. Take care. Good to see you. All right. We are going to uh, share a little bit here with um, to show you what we're doing next with our UDL IRN. And here we go. As promised, this is David Rose bio. So I will leave it up here for just a moment so that you can uh, read it and see what a wonderful man he is. Um, notice that he uh, certainly is a co-founder of CAST. He's written many books, and I think probably the coolest thing on this resume is that last line that in 2004, he got the George Lucas Educational Foundation's Utopia Magazine Award for the Daring Dozen. So that is right. pretty awesome stuff. Yeah. Yep. I, it's, it's just amazing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go it ahead. It is amazing, Brian. There's everything. Look at that bio. I mean, it is, uh, that is a 12 font, by the way, mm -hmm. on PowerPoint. So you know this man has done some really good stuff. 
Uh, I just wanted to mention finally that um, we have our next Network and Learn coming up on November 15th. You can get it at udlirn.org as a place to register. Really excited about this session as well. Um, we have folks from uh, three different school districts uh, in Indiana and in Michigan and in um, uh, Maryland, and they're talking about uh, universal design from learning from the district, district perspective. And they're going to talk about their journey and how they implemented uh, universal design for learning framework throughout their entire school district. So come join us for that. It's going to be another great night. We have three panelists, uh, George Van Horn from um, Bartholomew School District, Carrie Wozniak from Fraser Public Schools, and then we have um, one of the Hyatt team members from Montgomery County Schools. And then always don't forget that our UDL IRN 2017 Summit is coming up. Registration is open. We've got uh, pre-conferences March 29th and then uh, sessions March 30th and 31st. So head over to udl-irn.org to sign up and register. And as Brian mentioned, UDL chat is happening next. So get on that Twitter feed or stay on that Twitter feed and join in in the conversation. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you joining us tonight. And Brian, I'm gonna let you have the last word. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I just wanna make sure that, that uh, this really happened, right? I mean, we just had David Rose on. Uh, we're bringing in George Van Horn, uh, Kerry Wozniak and, and the Hyatt team next. next. Uh, we, I, this is real? And this is free? And Are you kidding me? Wow. That's how we get it done in UDL IRN, folks. That's how we get it done in UDL, period. So thank you, everybody. Peace, love. Thank you.